is the evacuation procedure. For those of you who don't know, um, we will depart the building. If, no, we, we are not expecting any um, fire alarm tests. So if the alarm does sound, it's likely to be a genuine emergency. And so please exit the building by the nearest safest exit. If you'd like to be that door, or if we can't use that door for whatever reason, it can be the front door that you went to the building by. Please go to assembly point G on the car park, which is just outside the window over there, and wait there until the pop officer for this evening, which is Mr. Tobin, says it is safe to do otherwise. Please don't simply go home because the fire brigade will be checking everyone from the attendance list that you all entered into as you joined the building. Agenda item number two is apologies for absence or members away on official council business. Mr. Tobin. Thank you, Chair. Uh, we've had apologies uh, from Councillor Tony Clues and the substitute is Councillor Denise Clues. Apologies from Councillors Deakins, David Humphreys, Lees, Mawson and Moss. And we've had apologies from Councillor Hayfield, who substitute. So, members, those are for your information. Um, Councillor Mrs. Clues and Councillor Jordan, welcome to the meeting. Um, I hope you enjoy it. Thanks. If it lasts until 10 o'clock at night, it will be your fault. Um, agenda item number three is disposable pecuniary or non pecuniary interests. Does anyone have anything you wish to share? No, thank you. Um, agenda item four is minutes of the board held on the 6th of December. Are you all happy that I sign it as a true and correct record? Sorry, yeah. Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, members, I'd now, I'm sorry to uh, uh, change the agenda around a little bit. I'd like to um, bring forward um, application of 473 for land to the east and southeast of Dunton Hall, Kingsbury Road, to the beginning of the agenda. We feel content with that. Um, we have uh, some speakers, Mr. David Bryson, Mr. Andrew McLeavy, and Mr. Patrick Dunham. Gentlemen, we've only got two chairs and speakers for one, but if you two you can sit there in one squat, um, and uh, Mr. Brown will introduce his report. Mr. Brown. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Let me just um, move through the slides first, then. I'll have to move very swiftly because. Um, Several items here which um, we'll come back to. Here we are. I'll just run through initially through um, some of the slides, Mr. Chairman. Um, members will be aware that there was a deferral of this item at the last meeting that a supplementary report could be provided, which to cover um, three issues which were raised at that particular time. Um, and they're, they're referred to actually in the report in front of you. But just let me run through the slides uh, to remind members of, of the proposal. Um, the application site here is outlined in red. Um, as I know it's not very possibly not very clear, Dunton Island. Um, Junction 9 is here, the M42, and then the Kingsbury Road, the 4097, going from Dunton Island up to Marston and Kingsbury here with the construction access here, leading over the line of the M HS2, which would be through here, onto the main site itself, which is here, and then the operational site onto Ham's Lane, Ham's Lane which is here, with the village of Lee Marston over here. And that's the site plan. <coughs> And in terms of the layout, um, actually on the main site itself, um, the line, this is the line of the overhead lines um, and the protection area outlined in green or shaded in green. You can see the battery storage areas um, and the transmission centre down here with the battery storage. Um, a bit more detail there. This is the landscape plan, landscaping plan, which came in after the report um, last time to show enhanced landscaping um, along the eastern boundary. Um, I don't know if members can remember the previous uh, um, plan, but this, this in fact is it shows enhanced planting down the eastern boundary. And I'll come back to that in a minute. 
Um, as I say, Mr. Mr. Chairman, um, the item was deferred for three reasons, uh, and those were outlined in the report for you. The first was to do with the county minerals situation, um, and the, the county's letter is attached as one of the appendices to the report. Um, now, this is because um, the land um, is within a mineral safeguarding area. In the first plan I've got here is the 1995 um, minerals plan, watching minerals plan, which shows quite a large area. Uh, the site is in here, um, as you can see, it's a large area central to the site. Now, clearly, HS2 is going through here, um, and therefore, um, now that is commitment, um, the county council has, has had to revise the minerals um, safeguarding area. And this is the area which is now included in the plan, its latest proposals. The application site is here, so it's excluded from the mineral site, and HS, the line of HS2 is here. Um, you'll see from the report, Mr Chairman, and indeed the County Council's letter, that the County Council has no objection on sterilisation grounds. They did raise a couple of issues, detailed issues, on dust and surface water, but as you'll see from the report, Mr Chairman, they've agreed to conditions, um, and those conditions are outlined in the, re in the recommendation in front of you tonight. And again, the County Council has agreed to that, agreed to those conditions as outlined in the letter attached to the report. The second issue was the cumulative impact. Um, this is raised by the Parish Council. Um, and remember that members saw some plans which the, County, which the Parish Council circulated at the last meeting. Um, I agree that that's certainly a material consideration, but the report already does um, evaluate the, the, the Greenbelt impact and says it is significant. Um, the cumulative impact is taken on board in that overall assessment. So therefore, in fact, the, the, the Greenbelt arm remains as significant. However, as members will know, that does not mean an automatic refusal on Greenbelt grounds. Um, that significant harm has to be put on the harm side of the balance, and you have to weigh the harms against the benefits or advantages of the site um, and the development in the final planning balance. So the fact that maybe cumulative greenbelt harm here is not necessarily a single reason for refusal. You have to undertake that final balance, which obviously the applicant has done and it's referred to later on in the report. And finally, there are the access arrangements, uh, which are referred to. Um, HS2's position on this um, is outlined in the report. There's an appendix there which indicates that they're comfortable um, with access, um, operational access being onto Hounds Lane at a later date. Um, discussions have taken place with the County Council on this. Um, the highway's position is that, um, that, that, that that can be safeguarded through the wording of appropriate conditions. And, and those are attached um, on the recommended conditions that you have in front of you. Um, conditions 4, 5 and 6. Um, and the County Council is satisfied that that safeguards their position in respect of both access points. Just to bring you up to date, Mr Chairman, uh, Historic England has come back to say they've got no objection. This is because of the potential impact on Dunton Hall, which is, which is here. Um, at the last time, members were looking at mitigating impacts, and you've clearly seen the um, up-to-date um, landscaping plan, which I showed you a minute ago. Um, the applicant has also provided a set of images, um, which you, Mr Chairman, asked for at the last meeting. Um, the site boundary is along here, um, and the planting, um, I'll just run through them, as you can see, um, will gradually increase um, into year 15, um, which is the, the, the development along here. Um, so that's the impact which the applicant is telling you um, will, will occur as a result of that of planting on the eastern boundary. Notwithstanding that, Mr Chairman, um, the applicant and the parish council have been in further discussion. Um, uh, this was particularly mentioned at the last meeting and encouraged. Um, and there has been general support, I understand it, that the Parish Council and the applicant agreed to an additional bund um, on the inside of the site, along the eastern boundary and around to the northern boundary. If I just go back, Mr Chairman, I can show you where I mean. So what they're suggesting is that in addition to the planting, there can be bunding along here, here, and part of along the northern side, um, that bund's likely to be about two metres high, something of that, something of that order, um, with additional planting on its east outward facing slope. 
Um, so as a, a result of that, Mr Chairman, um, the recommendation still stands. Um, the recommendation um, clearly will have to include um, potentially um, the pos possibility of funding. What I'm suggesting, as you have no details in front of you, Mr Chairman, um, is that the recommendation includes uh, another subject to subject to funds along the eastern and northern boundary in the application site being agreed with the council. Now, if that is accepted tonight, uh, the applicant can obviously prepare details of more detailed plans of that funding. We will then consult the parish council um, on that particular funding. And I would recommend, Mr Chairman, that um, the comments of the parish council are brought back perhaps to yourself, the vice chairman, the opposition planning spokesperson and the local members for agreement given that if the board is minded to support in principle, then that should not be a matter which is, should need to be referred back to the full planning board. Only one other item, Mr Chairman, which I, I, I received from the notes I forgot to say, is a condition in, in the recommendation in front of you to do with noise. Um, the environmental health officer has looked at that. The environmental health officer is comfortable with conditions on noise, but has asked for us, them, those to be strengthened um, and I circulated to um, substitute conditions on noise to members last week, and there are hard copies in front of members tonight um, with those conditions on. So, Mr. Chairman, I, again, the recommendation will have to include those substitute conditions um, if, if members are minded to support. Um, I'll leave that there, Mr. Chairman, because that's quite an update on, on where we were at the last meeting. Thank you, Mr. Pan. Welcome back, Kevin. Thank you. Mr. Cohen, I believe you will have uh, in a moment three minutes in which to address the board. Uh, I'll tell you when your time starts, I'll tell you when you have one minute remaining, and I'll tell you when your time's ended. Thank you. Your time starts now. Okay. Before you start, sorry, do I have to press this button or will it automatic? Uh, no, press, press, press it so there's a green light. I'd like to focus again on location. Appendix J of the officer's report sets this out. The UK is committed to closing down coal power stations. It is going to happen and will leave a generation fed hole and generate electricity. The UK needs four times more renewables installed to satisfy our carbon goals and help secure our energy supply. There is an excess of renewable energy produced in the north and not enough power to meet demand in the south and the Midlands. Renewable energy is wasted because it can't be used in the north or transported to the south due to the existing transmission lines becoming overloaded. The National Grid identified a zone in the Midlands where energy storage should help solve the problem to act as a ballast on the network, a seesaw, so to speak. The idea is surplus energy comes into the Midlands and can be used, stored, or sent to the south using existing infrastructure. The alternative is a new transmission line from Scotland to London and new gas fired power stations along the route, funded by even higher energy bills, and this is not their intention. To support National Grid, these projects need to be big. There are only 21 substations in the UK where large storage can be accommodated. 11 of these are in the wrong place, so are not relevant. Of the 10 remaining, only two are in the Midland zone identified by National Grid. Both of these are in the green belt around Birmingham. The other site, Sandwell, northwest of Birmingham, has significant land and connection constraints, and it's not possible to connect a project large enough for National Grid's minimum requirements. Planning for a storage project was granted recently in the green belt there, but as mentioned, it's too small to meet requirements. Only Hams Hall has land and grid capacity available for a project at the right scale. And we agree with your officer, this satisfies the very special circumstances required to build on Greenbelt land. We've listened to comments from statutory consultees and members who made adjustments to mitigate effects of the project. The layout has been changed following feedback from the case officer and consultees. Lee Marson requested more planting on the eastern boundary. We are adding significantly more semi-mature trees and hedges. Lee Marson have asked for a bond and we will work directly with the council to provide this, providing both the noise and visual screening. Members raised questions about noise. We accept the officer's new conditions to ensure noise is not an issue. We will offer an annual £15,000 benefit fund. We've agreed to work with Lee Marston and will commit £9,000 of this annually to their green initiatives, the rest of it between Kirdworth and Lee Marston Parish Council. Household bills are soaring and getting higher because we rely on other countries for our power. We need to take back control of our supply and building projects like this will enable the UK to stop this unsustainable reliance on others and reduce our bills. Our proposal significantly contributes towards climate emergency goals nationally and locally and will help secure supply. This project facilitates enough new energy generation to power an area the size of the West Midlands. And I therefore respectfully ask you to approve the application as your officer has recommended, and we accept the conditions that go with it. 
Thank you very much. <coughs> Do you have any questions for our speaker? Thanks, Martin. Yeah, thank you. Um, sort of a technical question. I probably wouldn't have some answer. But, um, the, um, the solar panels, there's a degradation. It's storage, there's no solar panels. There's no solar panels, it's just okay. What's the projected sort of battery life? So we would expect the uh, units we put online on site to last a minimum of 15 years. It would probably be need of one refresh over the lifetime, the 30 year lifetime of the project. So we probably put it over two sites. And we'd expect the next generation to be smaller, better, more efficient. That's uh, the guarantee we get from our manufacturers today gives us 15 years. So how have you been an operation with the refresh? Uh, it will be smaller than, it's considerably smaller construction than the initial. There'll be no construction uh, whatsoever. It would simply be um, vans going in, taking old cells, putting in new cells. So considerably smaller as what they but there is no guarantee that if, like, if they go going fine, that's just the manufacturer. Yeah, right, right. Sort of more than <clears throat> Any other questions, members? I, I just have one. Um, you referenced in your, your remarks about um, some uh, additional funding to the parish councils and the ecological arrangements. And whilst I accept that that's entirely separate to the planning application, how will that be um, arranged? Are you, are you having a separate voluntary undertaking between the company and the council's concerned? We would like it, yeah. We, we haven't got into the details of how it would be done. We've done it in numerous different ways, but yeah, happy to have undertaken to, to do it. We, I've had quite a lot of collaboration with Lee Marston quite recently about how it can be used. And so the Green Initiative Fund, you know, we have to work out how that gets paid, whether it's annually, lump sum, or, or whatever. But yeah. It would be an agreement between us, the project company, and I don't know how the, the sort of the green initiative thing is set up, whether there's a company that controls it or whether it's just individuals who sort of work on it, but it would be between us, the parish councils, and this sort of the green initiative, basically. And, th and that's a certain um, agreement now between... Once the project gets commissioned, yeah. Yeah. So subject only to us granting consent. Yeah. <laughs> <clears throat> okay. And members... Final chance. Any other questions? I mean, last time I think we asked several million questions and more every day, but you're all, you're all content. In which case, I think the answers have been provided to the questions that we asked last time. Thank you. Thank you, gentlemen. So, over to yourselves. Who would like to speak first? Councillor Jarvis. Thank you, Chair. I think uh, when you look at this, and it's quite an extensive report, and I actually find it very easy to uh, easy, easy to understand the way it's been put out. And knowing the questions that were raised last time, and as Councillor Dirley said, I think they've all been answered uh, very significantly. And th there's been no wall put around them. They are straightforward answers. And uh, having been on the site visit and seen the, uh, the layout of it, and the extra screening, I certainly would be minded to support the application. Thank you. Councillor Bell. Thank you, Chairman. Yeah, um, yes, it's always difficult when we talk about Green Belt because we have to take it seriously. But I agree that I think on balance, this is a, a national strategic initiative that we need to support. I think, and so I'm happy to support um, the officer's recommendation with the additions that he gave at the beginning of the meeting. The only thing I'd say is that this does illustrate how some of our green belt is being um, ungreened, I think is the way to put it, uh, for various reasons. Some of them really good reasons, some of them we can't we can't do anything about because it's HS2. And I would like as a separate recommendation to say that we need to look at our green belt again, a new green belt strategy where we can replace green belt that's been damaged in this way. This is not a reflection on this application. This is just a general issue about the green belt, which this has illustrated. So I'd like to put that forward. And I, I don't disagree, Councillor, just for the avoidance of any doubt, this land will remain in the green belt. So yeah, we're, we're not removing the green belt designation no. from this site. No, no, we no. could do, but we're not. Uh, and so the protections will still be there, just be 
Yes. But we, we would look for new fresh land as well. Yeah. <coughs> Thank you. Councillor Clues. Thank you, Chair. Um, it's a bit like Councillor Bell. People know I'm the tree organ <laughs> and uh, the green space saver. And I was here at the last meeting, obviously I weren't sitting on the board then and I had read all the papers um, and I'd love to admit um, this is probably one of the few that I would reckon, you know, um, go for. So I'm happy to second the recommendation. But again, I think we you know, seriously need to look at that green belt, but this is one that I'd be quite happy to second. Thank you. Any other comments, members? I think really to add my voice to those that have already been um, said. Um, we have a green agenda and we can't achieve that without some sort of sacrifice, but we need to make that sacrifice as little as possible. And we still need to protect the interests of our residents. And I think through the discussion of officers and different councils and the applicants. I think uh, Parish Council may support me in this and that um, we seem to have got as good a deal as we can for as much gain as we can um, for society as a whole and our green agenda. <coughs> and I would be happy to uh, support this application on those grounds. But I think uh, Councillor Bell is perfectly right in saying that if we are dimbling away at the edges of the green belt, it's no good saying it is still green belt. We actually need to be looking at the, at the wider area as well. Yeah. Thank you. And, and just as a side note, we seem to be getting quite a lot of applications at the moment that involve um, semi mature trees and things being put in the landscaping. I would question where we are going to get these from if it continues. Uh, thank you, members. Uh, as you are aware, this site is in my ward um, and one that, that's sort of very um, important to um, people locally. I, I have always defended green up policy and gone against almost every application that I can remember that seeks to develop the green belt. Uh, but over the time, we have declared a climate change emergency and we all know that we need to find um, methods of providing electricity. So I think the argument needs to be more nuanced than it has in the past. We certainly need, to, I think, I agree with what uh, our Councillor Bell, Councillor Clues and Councillor Dervis have said about an urgent review of our green belt managers. Um, but this application seeks, I, th I think, rightly to build on the evidence strategic national need for changing um, infrastructure. It is frustrating, I'm sure we all agree, that we had for several years, decades, protected land on the Hemsworth estate for a use such as this until the landowner said they didn't, we didn't need it. And evidence of the fact that we didn't need it. And clearly we do. Um, decisions like this one are always on a fine balance. And I also think that given the evidence strategic national need, the remediation condition that will bring this land back into near agricultural use at the end of 30 years, um, the substantial work that's been done to develop um, buns and biodiversity on the site. This tips the balance for me into a use that can be compatible with Greenbelt. Um, so I'm, like the rest of you, I think, persuaded of the argument. Um, so uh, I'd like to take the, decision, the, the uh, motions in two parts. First one being the recommendation, which is minded to support, printed in the agenda in front of you with the substitution of this clause on noise. And secondly, uh, another motion on, on a different issue related to the Green Belt. So um, I think Councillor Jarvis, you proposed um, the motion seconded by Councillor Bell. Can I see those in favour? And any against? That's unanimous. Uh, so planning permission, um, well, we can't grant planning permission. We are minded to support 
It will now go to the Secretary of State for his or her <coughs> And the second motion that's proposed by Councillor Bell is that we ask the, um, I'm quite sure the name of your subcommittee is. It was local yeah. development framework, but it's not. Really, is it? No, I don't think we've agreed on it, have we? It's strategic or in charge of all things planning and other issues. <laughs> we asked that to commission an urgent review of our green belt boundaries, specifically with a view to where possible extending green belt into other areas of North Warwickshire. Uh, for two reasons, really, the, lo the loss of green belt to um, HS2 and other uses, and the proposed uh, development that we have in our um, plan in other areas, so that other villages have their own uh, their countryside protected rather more. <laughs> Councillor? Yeah, um, no, I mean, I would support, I mean, no sooner have we finish one local development and we now start work on the second, we know the first piece of work we have to do is to look at employment sites and then there will be a second piece of work at some point down the line to look at housing allocation. So I think a sensible review is needed. Thank you. Um, so I think you proposed that, Councillor Bell. Uh, Councillor Clues, you seconded it. Um, any any other comments before we take a vote? I have to make one comment, Chair. And, uh, yes, I often support the um, the idea of looking at the green belt. Some of our in my community and the communities around it are not protected by green belt uh, and um, have not enjoyed a lot of protection. Um, I believe that should be extended to look at green spaces around those communities. We are in danger of conventions, I believe, and that is something that must be avoided. Absolutely, more than that to incorporate that, I think. I think that's entirely within the the context of where we're we going. Thank you, Chair. Um, all those in favour? Any against? Thank you very much. That's carried. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thank you very much. Thank you all very much. <laughs> so, members, we now move uh, back to the um, printed agenda to application number uh, 354 for land adjacent 54 Moore Road, Hartsey. Mr. Brown, you have some good news for us. I do, Mr. Chairman. I'm, I'm, I'm going back to the beginning of the agenda for the slides. I know I haven't read slide for this one, but I will have to continue with some of the subsequent ones to get them in order. And bear with me while I scroll back. Yes, Mr. Chairman. As you can see from the report, um, a couple of meetings ago, this was the third for an alternative look at the tree. Um, the county arborist has been out there and has concluded that yes, the tree is likely to have to be felled. Um, shortly, but there's no immediate issue, um, and therefore um, the, 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 the tree will be re re revisited, if I put it that way, in a couple of years' time. As a consequence of that, the application has been withdrawn. Well, I think we can all happily note that. Next, uh, the next application, which I think has also got some good news. To spread. Yeah, exactly the same, Mr. Chairman. Again, um, the, the, it was deferred last time. It was deferred last time it came to board, so that members can look at alternatives to felling the trees. Some members made a slight visit um, to Colin Park with um, the county arborist, and an alternative was suggested, in other words, raising the footpath rather than actually felling the trees. Um, as a consequence of that, um, our, our colleagues in the streetscape scheme, street, streetscape section, have taken that on board and withdrawn the application. Another welcome decision. I think. Yeah. Can I just make a comment about that? That it is good to hear that uh, our questioning of the reports actually has borne fruit. Yeah. Um, you know, it would be very easy to just sit back and say, oh, well, we've got this recommendation, we'll go with it. Sometimes that is very definitely the necessary course of action, but it is good to hear that we have managed to actually make a difference on these. <coughs> Absolutely. Um, the next application is number 473, Lexus Farm, Neaton Road, Furness End. Um, we have two speakers. Um, the first of which will be Leslie and the Burn. Um, to Excuse me, Chair. Have we just jumped on. Yeah. Oh, yep. Yeah. I apologise. You're absolutely right. 
Um, application 0660. Yes, application number 660 for seven Bury Bank, Furness and Coleshill. Mr. Brown. Um, as you can see, Mr. Chairman, this is this is only reported to you because the applicant is a member of staff. Um, I can just run through the slides, which repeat what's in the paper report. Um, you can see the site is here at the end of Bray Bank, a short cul-de-sac, um, half a dozen houses or so. That's the existing front elevation. Um, the, 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 the bow window would go here um, to replace that. And in terms of actual plan form, that's it. It doesn't come forward beyond the porch. It's a straightforward bay, bay window, Mr Chairman. Um, there are no, no immunity impacts and we've not had any objections from the neighbours. Thank you, Mr Brown. Members, any comments or questions? The recommendation, yeah. And second up is Thank you very much. Those in favour? That's unanimous. Thank you very much. We now move on to Alexis Farm. Uh, so we have two speakers, the first of which is Ms. Leon Vernon. Ms. Vernon, if you'd like to take the, the speaker's chair while Mr. Brown introduces his report. Mr. Right. Brown. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I'm, I'm not going to repeat at length what's in the report, but to summarise it, if I can go through the slides first, um, then um, this is the road B414 that comes up from um, Oberwitzka, Furness End uh, to Nuneaton. Um, Laxis Farm is set some, some way back from the main road, as you can see with the access from the track here. Um, these are the farm complex, the farm complex of buildings, the farmhouse is here. Um, there are residence cottages here, um, with where the objections have come from, which you'll hear about, I suspect, in a minute. The application site is at the area edged in red, which is on the side of the farm complex facing um, the objectors or facing the residential properties down here. Um, and in terms of the actual um, boilers and the housing around them, um, you can see that there, the three um, projecting above the, um, the roof of the housing by three metres. Um, and them inside. Um, and then in terms of the location of those, those in respect to the listed buildings, the farmhouse is a listed building, that just shows you or illustrates a bit better um, where the two are in relation to each other. And then the additional landscaping, which is being suggested um, as part and parcel of the proposal. Um, you'll see from the report, Mr Chairman, there are additional photographs attached in paper form um, to your report. Um, I just need to, 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 to point out that clearly photographs taken at different times of day, different seasons and the different smoke um, emissions um, should not be taken necessarily at face value. It's, a, it's, a, it's, it's something that happens over time. And just, uh, just record that with, with a caveat if you're looking at the photographs. Um, you can see from the report, Mr Chairman, that um, this has been going on for some time. Officers and particularly um, environmental health officers have been engaged with the applicant in order to try and improve, improve emissions from these boilers um, and have not been able to do so. Um, such that our environmental health officers have clearly indicated to us um, that the standard of emissions does not meet um, our supplementary planning document on air quality. Um, that's from, from a planning point of view, that means there is definitely a refusal here, a recommendation of refusal. Um, that's then tied up with the use, um, which, as you see from the report, um, is, is not um, authorised. Um, and therefore, if members are going to refuse the planning permission for the boilers, um, they have to consider the expediency of enforcement action. Um, now, as the report indicates, Mr Chairman, um, a wood business such as this, a firewood business as this, um, probably is best located in a rural area. It's probably best located in a farm, a large farm complex. Um, and therefore, it's not necessarily um, a use which, um, as a matter of principle, should be refused um, in this location. It's a matter of how it's managed and perhaps more in more detail where specifically on the, within the farm range it is located. Therefore, um, we're suggesting here, Mr Chairman, that if um, planning commission is refused, um, enforcement action be taken to cease the use of the boilers um, such that... Um, Discussion and negotiation can continue with the applicant to see if we can get a revised application, um, which would be satisfactory to both the applicant, to environmental health officers and to local residents. Um, and that's the reason, reason behind the recommendations that you have in front of you tonight, Mr Chairman. Thank you, Mr Brown. <clears throat> Welcome. Thank you. Mr Chairman. this application. Uh, you will be given three minutes to address the board. I'll tell you when three minutes starts. I'll tell you when you have one minute time, 
And I'll tell you when three minutes is up. Thank you. Do I need to activate the device? Yeah, please. A bit of a dinosaur, so bear with me. Very nice on its own. Thank you. Time stops now. Good evening. I appreciate the opportunity to speak briefly in support of the objections already declared in great detail in our recent communication to each of you. I don't intend to revisit the contents of that lengthy script and hope that you've had opportunity to study it. I do wish to say that although we are a very small community, I do not feel that we matter any less than any other community and feel that our strenuous and ongoing objections to this intrusive operation are made with the local environment, community and all of our welfare issues at heart. We feel very strongly that our environment and climatic responsibility is a grave and crucial one, and further that we need to act forcefully and purposefully in order to protect the environment that we are fortunate enough to reside in. We purchased our much loved home in 2013, many years before the implementation of Arden Logs, and frankly would never have made the purchase had such an offensive operation already been in situ. Arden Logs was duly foisted upon us without consultation, without planning permission or compliance with relevant authorities and persists, despite a clear desist directive from NWBC issued some months ago. No such cessation or even reduction in activity has been observed. Five years ago, we embarked upon a very extensive building project at our home prior to the installation of Arden Logs and the associated kilns and boilers, and our project was specifically geared to take full advantage of our vista and open views. This included a two-storey extension and balcony, which we were able to previously enjoy. It's of note that we operated in strict consultation with planning, and although not all of our proposals were approved, we remained entirely compliant and respectful of planning directives. And we wonder why Arden Logs have not complied accordingly, as they have been formally directed to do. As detailed in extensive communications and some 500 pieces of video and photographic evidence, we are now subjected to endless foul smoke emissions, nuisance noise, including chainsaw and heavy machinery operation, and we experience this as clearly evidenced at all times of the day and night. We cannot open windows or enjoy our outside space, and our home is often invaded by foul smelling smoke. Our enjoyment of our home that we've invested extensively in, both financially and emotionally, has been entirely blighted by this unplanned industrial type operation. And we desperately hope that this now comes to an immediate and permanent end so that we can resume our lives and enjoy the peace and clean environment that we and the whole community are being wholly deprived of and are surely entitled to enjoy. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, members, do you have any questions for us, people? Yeah. You said that you uh, were unable to enjoy. Excuse me. It's difficult in here, so okay. it's more difficult at the back. Sorry. You mentioned that uh, you were unable to enjoy your um, your balconies so at night as well. Could you give an idea as to how long the uh, kilns are in use? Yes, sir. Yeah. As the um, applicant himself will confirm, the boilers and kilns are in use 24-7. Thank you. Councillor Thompson. Thank you, Chair. Um, chainsaw operations. Can you give us some idea of, the, of how frequently chainsaws are being used and what sort of time periods during, during the day? Okay, the chainsaws are used very regularly because the wood's cut every day. And um, when the chainsaw is our operation, we can be subjected to it for four or five hours during a typical session. Thank you. Thank you. So you say you can't enjoy the fresh air from your balcony, so obviously, um, can you put any washing out or anything? No, ma'am, we're not able to um, use our outside space. Um, as Mr Griffin and Mr Green are aware, um, our grandchildren can no longer um, use our outside space. Um, we haven't used our balcony or um, our outside space in any real way for two years. Thank you. Any more? Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Uh, members, our next speaker is Mr David Harris-Watkins. 
Ms. Wilkins, if you'd take the chat. Welcome to the meeting. Um, Mr. Tony, uh, as you've probably just seen, you, you'll also get three minutes now to address the board. Um, the switches on the microphone, the, the green lights come on. I'll let you know um, when the three minutes start. I'll let you know when you have one minute remaining, and I'll let you know at the end of three minutes. Time starts now. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak. I'm here today to urge the members of the committee to defer the application so the outstanding issue can be resolved. The application is brought before you recommended for refusal because of an objection from the Council Environmental Health Officer. As part of the application, an air quality assessment was submitted on the 6th of August demonstrating that boilers can be run in accordance with the planning of forest guidance. On the 2nd, 22nd of October, the Environmental Health Officer stated that he felt he needed more information but did not go into great detail what was required. Since then, our air quality consultant has emailed the Council's Environmental Health Officer on the 4th of November the 12th of November and the 7th of December, and has ran multiple times, has had no reply. I personally managed to speak to the Environmental Health Officer at the site on the 17th of November, but only because I was notified by the Planning Officer that the Environmental Health Officer would be visiting within a two hour window to see if the smoke issue had been resolved. This, would, this was not meant to be a meeting, but I waited at the site in order to be able to speak to the Environmental Health Officer because of the difficulty in contacting him. I'm not an air quality consultant and I do not have specialist knowledge in this field. However, at the meeting, we identified that at that time the boilers were producing an acceptable amount of smoke, of smoke and that a permit would only be required if the boilers used to waste wood. It was, it was agreed moving forward that the, the, the boiler would only use um, kiln dry wood. The applicant's air, air quality consultant rang following the meeting multiple times has not received a response. The Dock Planning Department have now brought an application before you recommending refusal for, out, for an outstanding objection from a statutory consultee when that consultee is unreachable and not, has not clarified what additional information they require. As is highlighted in the committee report's discussion of how to deal with enforcement if refused, the Planning Department do believe it is possible that biomass borders can be run successfully at the site. However, we believe it can be regularised as part of this application. I appreciate you just one minute remaining. remaining. I appreciate due to circumstance the last year and the pandemic, meaning delays were inevitable, but I do not I do not believe refusal can be issued on the basis of outstanding information required by a statutory consultee, and that consultee has not clarified what information they require, and that over 29 weeks of the application, the applicant has been waiting on responses from that statutory consultee, including the current outstanding response. I says, therefore urge the committee to defer the application so the matter can be resolved. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much. Members, do you have any questions? Thank you. Um, I can hear your frustration with the environmental health department. I'll just put that to one side for a minute. Um, you, you will obviously have been aware, I'm sure, of, of objections by your neighbours to the smoke that's been produced. And I wonder why nothing's been done. If you think it can be done uh, to your neighbour's satisfaction, why hasn't it been done already? And what would make it able to be done in the future? that you can't do now, so it's really funny. Um, sorry, <laughs> I do have notes. Um, so work has been carried out to the boilers. Um, previously, um, the applicant would admit that he was operating them without best practice. However, since then, uh, all three boilers have been serviced. Um, basically, they've been completely taken apart and then put that together by um, specialist engineers and they've been shown how to use the boilers correctly and that what maintenance periods they should be enforcing, how often they should be doing and then the operators themselves beyond just the applicant because he has a number of employees also been shown how to better operate them. Um, as you'll see from the photos submitted by the objectors, it, it was quite bad originally, but then now they've shown essentially been shown how to use it correctly, that the smoke has been significantly reduced and that was evidence on site when the planning officer and the environmental health officer was on site when I was there. Admittedly, there are fluctuations throughout the day, but there's certainly been a significant improvement from when the application was originally submitted. Just got to talk to you. So what you're saying is that 
should they be firm, you could demonstrate an acceptable level of smoke in the I don't think currently the smoke is the reason for refusal. I think it is for the, um, because it doesn't adhere with the, uh, not enough information submitted to adhere to the air quality aspect of the council. And that could be correct. Yes, ah, uh, that's exactly. Councillor Parsons. Thank you, Jeff. Um, looking at this, I, I can't say that the operators have you know, responsible. Um, they've begun operating on the mission. Um, they've operated with, uh, with poor performance in terms of actually you know, the output from the services. Um, yes, we now have the service dismantled. I would have no confidence that this is going to continue to be the case, that this irresponsible uh, operator is suddenly going to become responsible, other than actually if they are watched every moment of the day. Um, and I'd like your answer to that. Um, well, I believe you could issue a temporary consent rather than a permanent one. So if, if it wasn't, um, carry out to those standards, then it would, the time frame would lapse and they would have to uh, re reapply. And of course, if they hadn't at that point uh, and there were still falling foul of issues, then well, you wouldn't grant, uh, wouldn't grant the permission the second time around, so to speak. Thank you. Councillor Thank you. Um, I'm not an expert on rail running these sort of plans, but um, my experience of uh, drying wood in kilns from other places um, leads me to believe that the smoke is not the only problem here. Uh, it, it does state in the report that we are considering steam that arises from these operations. And my experience, depending on what wood you are drying, and how wet it is when you start, the uh, smell that comes off as seen is pretty obvious. <coughs> um, what sort of um, guarantees can we get from this applicant that uh, the steam that is produced by this unauthorised activity at present? isn't going to maintain the problem that we're talking about here with the smoke. Um, you know, like my colleagues here, I don't have very much um, faith in the responsibility of the operator at the moment. Uh, I, I need something to reassure me that uh, an improvement is going to be seen and that the uh, neighbours will be able to enjoy countryside in the ways that they were before. I accept that it is countryside and that you expect smells and you expect noise, but it is a matter of degree and uh, length of time that these happen as well. You know, apart from a relatively short time each year, noise doesn't continue late at night, smells like this don't necessarily continue all the time. What, what confidence can you give us that, that there is going to be an improvement? Um, I think one of the, the major issues originally was the type of wood being used. Um, they were using wood that was stored externally and they were using waste wood, uh, which he originally well, has a U4 exemption for, which basically didn't quite cover for he didn't fully understand the regulations and he would require a further permit for that. Um, since then, he's basically scrapped using the, um, the waste wood, which is a uh, virgin pallet wood. Um, so now he just uses the, the, his own kiln dried wood, which is meant to have a significant improvement, especially with the smoke. Because apparently, the smoke, again, I'm not a specialist myself either in this area, but I understand the smoke. It's mainly created from the biomass boilers when there's loads of gaps within the boiler chamber. So instead, when they're able to use large pieces of wood, it'll reduce the smoke. Um, in terms of guarantees, 
Um, again, maybe something uh, that you want to look at is a temporary consent because um, it will be strictly conditioned if, if approved, and if it isn't, then we'll to those uh, issues. And I imagine the council will be brought to point. But that is not answering the issue of what's in the kilns. That is only answering the issue of what is coming out of the uh, boiler fluid. Not <coughs> the, uh, um, the, the emissions from well, the, sorry. the, the, uh, the, the uh, rest of the operation, which is unauthorised. It yeah, was, well, sorry, in reference to that, I'm not a specialist in that area that I would have to seek some guidance myself on that from our quality consultant. Well, thank you. In the statement um, you've wrote here, during the winter to fill their seven days worth of deliveries, the business must process five days a week minimum. If there's any breakdowns, and the staff also must work through the weekends and run up to six o'clock, seven days a week in case machinery is break down. Then also the bins will not be filled prior to nine o'clock each day, but there will be a requirement to use the processing equipment, chainsaws, vehicles and boilers prior to nine a.m. in order to make the most of dying late hours during the winter months, though sometimes the business is forced to work later in the day when the sun is set in the winter. Do you yourself think that's reasonable for any neighbours to put up with those hours seven days a week? Well, the, the original reasoning for that was because, as, as it says, uh, the applicant originally said that the business can be operated on a minimum of five days and he wanted to ensure that basically planning conditions if approved didn't restrict those five days so for instance if the boilers broke down and then um, it took out like a, a day or two that he in turn would not lose two days worth of um, business so to speak by drying the wood i don't it is intention is not to operate to the extremity of those actors out Um, just a couple of questions from from me, Sir um, Harris Wilkins. I take it you're you're not the applicant; you're his no, agent, or I, I'm the agent. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. Um, on, on behalf of the authority, can I ask you to pass our apology to your client for the apparent delay that he has had in contacting members of the council staff? It, it's certainly far from best practice. I think COVID um, ex explains some of the issue, but certainly not not responding to issues is not the way we would wish to proceed. So. Genuinely, I apologise. Um, one area I'd like to clarify for me is the current hours of operation, because having read the report and heard the testimony from your neighbour, there is an apparent difference. So what, what in your understanding are the current hours of operation and the likely hours? Um, sorry, I can't recall that okay. off the top of my head, but the hours of operation, to the best of my knowledge, are what is stated in the report that the applicants passed me. So I can't, I can't comment on, of course, what the uh, new objective is. <coughs> okay, thank you. Uh, members, any other questions? In which case, thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much. Uh, members. Could I just apologise to members of the public? I keep forgetting to put the microphone on, and they probably can't hear what I'm saying most of the time. So my apologies. Consider yourself castigated. <laughs> um, Councillor Jones. Thank you, Chair. Uh, having uh, looked through this report, some details, and uh, it doesn't seem that, that it's an operation that is very, very well controlled, or that is very well, or very close to being environmentally friendly. Looking at uh, burning old pallets, old pallets are usually contaminated. So you're not just burning wood, you're probably burning tar, whatever, that's contaminated those. And when you look at the actual, at the boilers, they look a bit Heath Robinson to me, but more akin to the 1800s, let alone the 2000s. But it's just a boiler with a flue that sticks up in the air that chucks all the rubbish out. And, you know, you can maintain them all you want, but if they don't work, maintaining doesn't make them work. There are modern ways of taking fumes and 
effectively afterburners to clean them. Looking at this, I can't see any attempt to clean any of the, uh, the exhaust from these boilers. It's just a three metre high stainless steel stack stuck in the air that chucks the fume out. <clears throat> and lastly, looking at the, the description of the boilers, they are approved and benefit from an exemption to the Clear Air Act. And that tells me that they're saying they don't comply because it says on here an exemption under the Clean Air Act of 1993. Looking at all the points that's been raised and hearing to, to both sides, I would have no hesitation in supporting the recommendation and the expediency of, of looking at uh, enforcement. Thank you. Councillor Hancock. I, I'm, I'm not a technician on burners, so I'm not going to go into kiln for nothing. But my point is quite simple, that we've literally just supported an application for green energy in our borough. And we're now talking about an operation that is clearly not provided any kind of report that suggests that this is good for our environment and the fumes are under what we'd expect for the borough. Um, I feel a bit confused that a deferment's now being asked for so they can sort out the issues with planning. I believe that that could have been done before we got to this stage. So I feel that we've now got to a stage that actually a refusal is clearly on the cards. It's not a very good operation, it seems. The neighbours must be going through hell at the moment, which if we can't get confirmation on their working hours, then actually the neighbours don't know their working hours, except it seems to be going 24-7 at the moment, which is not something that we should be supporting. I think that to ask for a deferment, as I've said before, it, it's, it's now because we're now looking at a refusal. Now we're looking at we want to negotiate Negotiations should have been done long before now. So for me, I would support the, rec the recommendation of refusal. Councillor Parsons, oh, sorry, stop. Councillor Parsons, I think it was just linked to that, um, that, that this has been going on for two years, according to one of our speakers. And, you know, I, I would certainly second that. Uh, the opportunity. Um, Thank you. Councillor Parsons. Thank you, Chair. Um, I think the old, you know, the proverbial test, the bottom line is, would I be happy if I was living in this, this uh, operation? And I would not. And therefore, I can't really expect other people to. Um, there is no sense of responsibility being shown here. You know, planning permission is not applied for, this has been set up, um, and it's been for the neighbours, you know, we're here, we're doing it, we're going to get on with it. That is not the way to implement. It's not the way that we should tolerate. And I absolutely support the recommendation. Thank you. Members, I feel I, I have to advise you and guide you. Uh, the, the fact that somebody did not apply for planning consent should not form part of your deliberation. You should make the decision based upon the planning grounds as a, identified in the report. I, I absolutely share your concerns about any applicant that doesn't apply for consent, uh, but the fact is they haven't broke the law by not doing so. Um, I hope not you don't like it. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, any other comments or questions? In which case we've had a proposal from uh, Councillor Jarvis, um, seconded by everybody else who spoke, I think. Um, so if we, um, can I see those in favour of refusal? And any against? That's unanimous. Uh, so planning permission is refused as printed in the programme. Mr Brown. Um, do you want to move on to a second recommendation, Mr Chairman, that is subject to the decision for some action? So you, Chair, I, I actually added that to it as well. I think we need to take a separate yeah. vote. So it's proposed by Councillor Jarvis, seconded by... Councillor Durbix, all those in favour? Any against? That's unanimous as well. Thank you very much. Um, members, we now move on to application from 605 and 651 for land at Small Lane, Astley, and Nutter Lane, Astley. Mr. Brown, anything to add to your report? I'll just go to the slides, Mr. Chairman. Um, there are two um, applications here which are reported to you for information. The recommendation is that both sites are visited. 
Um, but let me just run through the slides because it's a little bit clearer seeing them on a large screen than, than on the paper. Um, in terms of their the location, um, then you can see the M6 motorway down here with Corley Services area. Reach Oak Lane is up here, Smoral Lane is along here, um, Astley Lane is over here. So the application of Smoral Lane is at the bottom here. Reach Oak Lane then goes up to Astley. Um, Park Lane is the lane that comes down in here to eventually to Longley. New Arley is here, and Nutthurst Lane is up here, which goes up to, towards Arnsley. And you can see the second site um, to the north. Um, so that just puts the two sites into context, which is a, as a colour plan, especially than the one you have in your in your papers. And in terms of the Smoral Lane site, um, this is, this is a much more detailed layout. This is solar panels; it's not battery storage. Um, although there are battery storage containers on the site down here, which will store um, the electricity from those these particular panels. Um, the footpath, which is referred to in the report, runs along here. Um, Great Lines Wood. Um, is here. Um, the motorway services area is down here. Um, and the vertical farm, which is referred to in the report, is at the bottom southeast corner down here. Uh, a bit more detail down here to show its access, the attenuation pond and the parking area. Um, then just to, I just run through these, these are repeats. There's the screen fencing and the tri type of transformers, the containers that will be on the site, again, the electricity substation, the camera details that will be around the site. And then clearly this is the um, this is the, the, the building, which you can see here, which have a sedum roof, um, six metres tall to its ridge, um, measuring 60 by 35. Um, the other site um, is simply a solar farm. There's some battery storage in each of the fields, as you can see here. Um, there's nothing else um, in terms of vertical farming, um, or, or it's simply just um, the panels. Um, the ponds which are referred to are located through the site. The overhead lines, that's one here, one here, and one here. Um, the footpath, which is referred to in the port from Arley, comes down this side of the, um, the site. Um, Nutterus Lane is over here, and Park Lane is further down, down here. Um, again, Mr. Chairman, I've not repeated that the um, the actual infrastructure and panels, because those are shown in the in, in, in the papers that you've heard in front of you. There's a detailed report there, Mr. Chairman, on outlining the proposals and the documentation that's come in um, and the submissions for both of them, which members can read. Uh, but in cases like this, Mr. Chairman, uh, as you're perfectly aware, it's the impact on the green belt and the visual impact, which are the key issues, I think. Um, therefore, that's the reason why uh, site visits are recommended for both of the cases that you have in front of you. Thank you very much, Mr. Bell. Members, anything to add or propose? I will propose that we uh, support the recommendation to look at it, see what is actually going to happen on the ground. Thank you. Second. 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 Any other comments, members? In which case, all those in favour? Any against? Thank you very much. That's carried. Uh, we now move on to application of Centre 5 for 92 Belfer Road for Arkansas. Um, we have uh, a speaker, Mr. Roger Lee, who will be talking to us via Teams. So, I'm sure there are far more technical skills than me can um, bring our speaker in, into the room with us. Um, but in advance of that, Mr. Brown, would you introduce the report? All right, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, as a member, as you can see from the report, this, this application is brought to you uh, because of your past interest in the site, um, and that is that the Planning Commission is granted for a new car park here. Um, a couple of meetings ago, and there were oh, if there were conditions, I beg your pardon, attached to that planning commission, which required discharge within a certain number of months from the, the grant of that planning commission, um, and that's caused this particular application to come in, um, and the three conditions are referred to in the report. Um, in terms of the detail covered, um, then the first one relates to, and it's not, I know it's not very clear on the, the plan, Mr Chairman, but if members may recall, um, but one of the conditions specifically wanted to look at the gap between the fence um, and the car park. There was a gap here um, with the residence um, um, gardens on this side. Members wanted that gap closed. It's not particularly clear on here, but the concrete plinth, um, which is referred to, I refer to in the report, is here. Um, this is the car park surface, uh, the curving around the car park. There will be a concrete plinth in here which will cover up the gap from the fence here. Um, the second um, condition relates to uh, the noise, the barrier. 
Um, again, a standard barrier with a raised arm here, and that will be located here on the layout. Um, so the start and customer car parks are here, and the car park, park management um, makes it clear that the, the arm would either be raised or removed um, when the car park was open, and then they would be replaced when the car park is closed within the hours which are already conditioned on the planning commission. Um, this car park is already um, used freely um, and has already been used freely, and there are, um, it's not part of the, um, the planning commission which members dealt with some time ago now. And then the final issue was the safety barrier, uh, which would go around the, the sites, um, so therefore one, two, three boundaries around the edge of the car park. Um, I mentioned was raised in the committee uh, in the last report, Mr. Chairman, about the possibility of an armco barrier. Um, the applicant has chosen or selected um, a knee-high um, timber frame here, as you can see, which members will have seen um, um, elsewhere in the borough and, and elsewhere. Uh, for various for various um, reasons, um, clearly that may not be what members were anticipating, um, and that's the reason why the police, um, um, secured by design officer, architectural liaison officer, was consulted um, on that particular proposal. And as you can see, um, he had no objections to this particular particular arrangement. Um, there are objections, Mr. Chairman, um, um, and representations there are, are raised in the in the paragraph. On page five, um, F79, um, those are the representations that we have received. Um, several of the representations cover other matters, um, and those are covered uh, on the final page of the report on five F80. Um, those matters, Mr. Chairman, will have to be dealt with separately. This planning application is only for the discharge of conditions on these three issues. Um, if there are other matters, which there are, um, they've been brought to our attention, they are being investigated, and as in, is in normal practice, reports are brought to you as and when necessary, Mr Chairman. Thank you, Mr Brown. Before we go to Ms Lee, I was under the impression we had two speakers, but only one appears on my list. Do, do we have two or just one? No, just one. Just one. Okay. Um, Mr Lee, welcome to the meeting. Um, Thank you. Can we uh, bring Mr. Lee up on the screen so that we can all see him? Is that possible? Okay. Um, well, I can see you on my screen, Mr. Lee, so I apologize that the rest of the board can't see you, but um, we will certainly listen to you. Um, I don't particularly want to disappoint having been um, having made the effort to get me on the screen, but to be honest, there isn't really anything I, I want to say. I think uh, Mr. Brown summarised things. Do the full Mr. Turner. Mr. Turner. Mr. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you, Mr. Lee. Uh, you may have seen the other applications being considered, and uh, what happens is that each speaker three minutes to address. Uh, the board for you on your time to watch so when you have one minute left and then when your time for your time starts. Yeah, can you hear me okay? We can indeed. Right. Well sorry, what all I was saying was that I I, I don't want to waste your time by saying stuff that's already been said by Mr. Brown. Um so there isn't really anything else for me to say at this stage. The points that he, he has made accurately summarise what's been proposed in, to discharge these conditions. And um, I, I, I can only I can only sort of support what he said and that, that accurately reflects what's being proposed. I have nothing else to say. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for your brevity. Uh, any spare minute is welcome back. Uh, members, do you have any questions for Mr Lee? In which case, Ms. Lee, thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Uh, members, over to you. Councillor Bell. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Uh, yeah, I mean, this, this has been an ongoing uh, issue that we've looked at at uh, planning for some time now, and we're now being asked to look at the discharge of conditions. I just want to propose the recommendation. Mm. Thank you, Councillor Bell. Councillor Hancock. I'll second it. Thank you, Mark. Members, anything else? In which case, it's been proposed and seconded. All those in favour? Any against? And that's unanimous again. So thank you very much indeed.
Uh, if we now move on to applications uh, 28, 29 and 30 for Old Whale Farm, Burley Common, Burley. Um, uh, Mr Stibbs is um, scheduled to speak to us, so Mr Stibbs, if you could stand by while Mr Brown introduces his report. Mr Brown. All right, thank you, Mr Chairman. As you can see from the report, this is this, this first um, referred to you several months ago. Um, let me just run through the slides, first of all, uh, to remind members of where we are. Um, Hurley Common runs from south up to north. This is, this is the line here. Uh, sorry, Mr Brown, could, could we have Mr Brown back on the screen then? Technically, the cavalry. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Sorry about that. <laughs> um, Let's start again. Um, Hurley is down here. Hurley Common, this comes up eventually going in, in, into Wood End. Um, Old Rail Farm is set back. As, as you can see here from that particular road. Um, the Hurley Sewage Works is down here, which is the bottom end of the site, um, and the access road um, comes up through here um, and eventually rounds through here. Um, the footpaths are marked on there, which they're also referred to in the report. Um, again, Hurley Common is here, top right-hand corner of the, the screen. The access road is this one, blue, the blue one here, which goes eventually up to the Sewage Works, as I was talking about. Old Rail Farm, the complex of farm buildings is here. The first application, which was for the which potential shepherd's hut, the shepherd's hut is here, outlined in red, with the walkway down here. Um, the car parking for that is here, um, in a small rectangle of land here. Um, picture of the shepherd's hut. Um, the HGV um, building, which members can refer to, is this one, and this is located here. Um, in the farm complex, and then the third application for the other uses is this building here, um, and then that is a, 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 a picture of that, that particular building. Um, one thing has changed, Mr. Chairman, since the report um, received, uh, since reporting back on the original applications, and as you can see, that is from the from the, from the description. Um, there's been the removal of the groom's residential accommodation. From the, the building that you see in front of you now. Um, throughout this, Mr. Chairman, the County Council as Highway Authority has maintained its highway objection. Um, they are saying it's a very difficult junction. Um, visibility is poor, it's a single carriageway, um, it's HGV usage of the site, um, and the visibility is very, very poor. Um, as uh, you can see from the report, Mr. Chairman, there are other Greenbelt harms which are outlined in the report. Um, basically, the conclusion from that is it's not that it's a hole, they're not preserving openness. Um, you can see from the report, Mr. Chairman, that both we and the County Council have had to look at other alleged um, unauthorised development here, and uh, particularly a haulage use, um, and references are, give, are given to that in the report. So, therefore, there are access and green belt issues here, Mr. Chairman. Um, in view of the maintenance of the um, highway projection, um, the other three applications are recommended for refusal, as you can see in the report, um, on highway grounds and greenbelt grounds, and therefore and the enforcement issues um, are also raised in the report. There are two or three recommendations, Mr Chairman, um, but as always, um, you would have to look at the planning applications first and then look at the expediency of enforcement action um, in respect of those three applications and any other issues that you want to see. Um, that's the reason why there are three recommendations in front of you, Mr Chairman. Thank you, Mr Chairman. Um, if we could go back, to, I, I know this is going to throw Jeff into the complete chaos, but could, if we could go back to Mrs Stimps on the screen. Thank you. 
Thank you very much indeed. So, Mrs. Stitz, welcome to the meeting. Thank um, you. Mr. President. Good evening. Uh, you may have seen the other applications. Uh, the speakers are allowed three minutes to address the board. I'll tell you when your three minutes starts, when you have one minute remaining and then when your time finishes. Thank you. Thank you. Your time starts now. Thank you. Um, this will just be short and sweet, tell you the truth. Um, I just would like to thank the chair for the opportunity to address the board this evening. I speak on behalf of my family and we formally request that tonight's meeting regarding our applications be deferred. This being due to the fact that we do not feel the report issued on the 5th of January gives a truthful and accurate representation of us. The report paints an image of us to the board that doesn't fairly represent our focus and our directions of our vision here at Old Rail Farm. We have been led to believe that the board intended to have a site visit and we would encourage them to do this before any decisions are made. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Mr. Stitt. Uh, members, do you have any questions for our speaker? No. no. In which case, thank you, Mr. Stitt. Uh, members, uh, you've heard the applicant request and deferment. Um, ordinarily, at this stage, would be wary, but given the suggestion that the report is misleading, I think it's important that we give the applicant the opportunity to restate their case and also I think it would probably be useful for us to have a site visit. But I'm, I'm in your hands. Councillor Philip. Yes, yes Chair, I, I think perhaps a site visit would be useful. Um, certainly, uh, I think, uh, certainly a look at the junction. I mean, it's difficult to describe this junction, but uh, I think that a uh, site visit probably would be useful. I, I agree with you. It's, uh, it wasn't something that I was I was prepared for, but uh, I'm, I'm prepared to support that. Thank you. Yeah, I was going to second that. Thank you very much. Just before we do, there's one technical issue that we need to advise you on, Mr. Tone. Uh, Chair, that won't now be relevant because you're deferring for a site visit. It was just a, a, a reference to one of the provisions in the Act was the wrong section, but that's not relevant to this point. Uh, and if the report comes back in a similar format, we'll make sure that's amended. Thank, Thank you. you. So, members, it's been proposed and seconded that we defer for the applicant to discuss the report in detail with our, our planning officers and for a site visit. Can I see those in favour? And only against. Thank you very much. That item is deferred. And, members, we dealt with application 473, so we now move on to applications 261 and 265. Uh, we have two speakers, Mr. Anthony Treadwell and Mr. Ian Mitchie. Uh, Mr. Treadwell, if you'd like to take the speaker's chair while Mr. Brown introduces his report. Mr. Brown. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, let's run through the slides first. Let's First of all, the location plan, Mr. Chairman. Um, two buildings are here, the farmhouse, which we should refer to in the barn. They are conjoined, uh, but effectively they are two buildings, as you'll you're see in a minute, um, with the curriculum behind. Um, in the centre of the village, um, the shop is down here, down here. No members did know, no ostrich. Uh, the green, and you'll probably recall um, the application that we had for the four or five houses um, off the green, um, which, which members can probably remember. Um, this is the proposed um, elevations of the barn. The barn is supposed to be demolished or dismantled, um, as the report says, um, and replaced with two um, cottages. Um, the front elevation, this will be the road elevation, um, with the rear elevation, as you can see here. Um, the, existing, uh, the existing front elevation 
is this. I know I'm pretty sure it's not very clear, but the existing elevation of the barn is here. This is the farmhouse. And then the rear is the farmhouse again. Um, and the barn rear elevation is here with the extension that you can refer, it's referred to in the report indicated there. Um, ground floor plans proposed with the two gables, as you can see, the two units. Uh, the farmhouse is here and the barn would, would be here. Um, and again, the plans. Uh, and the layout plan um, is clearly showing the farmhouse as a separate unit um, and the two units in lieu of the barn. And once that's dismantled um, here, with the access onto the road and the car parking here. Um, although there are two parts to the building, Mr. Chairman, um, it's um, treated as it's treated as a single listed building, the farmhouse and the barn. So the whole is listed as a grade two. Um, and therefore, from a planning and heritage point of view, you certainly want to look at the future of the whole, in other words, the two buildings. The farmhouse um, already has consent for restoration and, and work has started on that particular um, planning commission. Um, however, the, the buildings are conjoined, as you can see here, um, and the issue has arisen um, that in order to complete the restoration, um, parts of the barn would have to be dismantled in order to in order to implement the full planning commission, particularly provide the gable on the side of the farmhouse. Um, the applicant is saying that um, if that is dismantled here, then it's highly likely that the existing barn um, will collapse because of its state. And therefore the application has been submitted to dismantle the barn um, and effectively um, like replace that with two new units. Um, they're saying that the application, a consent here, uh, would enable financial confidence to continue with the whole project, um, particularly given the amount of, of money that has already been put into the, um, um, the, 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 the restoration work, the partial restoration work for the farmhouse. Um, however, you can see from the report, Mr Chairman, um, that the heritage agencies, um, Historic England and others, um, not just Historic England on their own, um, do not feel they have sufficient information um, or confidence in yet in, in the present time in order to support this particular application. In particular, they're worried about, obviously, I think, um, the dismantlement of this part of the barn and how it connects to the farmhouse. In other words, they're looking for a method statement as to how that um, work would actually be undertaken, um, potentially without damaging the rest of the barn. Um, Discussions between um, ourselves, the applicants and the agencies is ongoing, uh, but the present time, um, um, particularly the present time in terms of the preparation of this report, that further information as requested by the immediate societies has not been forthcoming. Um, the applicants clearly, as I said, is reluctant to provide that unless they have some degree of confidence in moving forward in, in, in what they're proposing on this particular, particular part of the site. I don't think officers, Mr. Chairman, and the heritage officer have a particular problem um, with two units being created from the barn um, or, um, as a matter of principle. It's a matter of the getting ensured that the community societies are satisfied with the way things may be done, and we're not in that position at the moment. However, because of the delay, um, as members can see from the report, um, no work, further work has been undertaken on the barn the present time there are there's some tarpaulins over the roof, uh, but no further work has been done for several months on that particular barn, unless there's some update which the, the applicant can refer you to the, the, later on this evening when they speak. Um, so Mr. we're in a sort of catch-22 situation, Mr Chairman, uh, and we feel that um, from a heritage point of view, we need to make a, put down a marker here um, and, and, and get things moving. And that's the reason why the recommendation, Mr Chairman, um, also includes um, reference to an urgent repairs notice. In other words, we need to secure um, the safety of, of this particular building uh, to make it wind and water type. Um, and that's the purpose of an urgent repairs notice. Um, however, the, an urgent repairs notice does have consequences um, and um, clearly um, it would have to outline the specification required um, to make that building wind and waterproof type. There's a cost involved in that, um, and if in fact work is not undertaken, um, then the council can itself do that work, and therefore it has to be aware of the cost. 
involved before a notice is served. And there may also be compensation arrangements. So it's not something which can be done lightly. However, it is within the realms of the, the legislation that you have available. Uh, and we feel, Mr Chairman, that it's now is the time to lay down a marker here uh, to say that, uh, yes, we hear what's always being said, uh, but uh, we need to see some movement um, in, in, in making this particular property safe uh, before we can start looking at the, 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 the barn over here. If the information does come in in relation to the dismantlement of the barn, and particularly this gable end, and historic England is satisfied with that and will withdraw the objection, then perhaps we can have a different recommendation. Uh, but until that time is reached, Mr Chairman, uh, the situation is, out, is outlined in the report for you. Thanks, Ben. Mr Cudwell, welcome back to the Council House. Thank you. Mr Cudwell. As you've probably seen with your applications, you're probably used to it by now, uh, you'll have three minutes to address the board. Um, the button on the microphone in front of me, in case I'll tell you when your time starts, when you've got a minute left, and okay. then thank uh, you. when the time finishes. So your three minutes starts now. Thank you. As previously stated, this property's entirety, including the barns, has been granted this status due to its historical importance in the heart of our village. As such, we strongly believe it should not be dismantled, but should be reinstalled in its entirety. At the planning meeting last June, we were told by Fiona Wallace that the building would be protected and watertight by September. Since then, no one has been anywhere near the property. We understand and appreciate that the building is in currently extremely poor state, but it's our belief that it has been left with, without suitable protective covering by the owners over many months, so they can use its poor state as an excuse to demolish it thus allowing them to build properties on the site. The plastic covering on the roof is now 90% gone, so there's no protection with it at all. Uh, to allow this planning application to go on ahead would make a mockery of the reason a property is given listed status and will set a dangerous precedent. Austria Paris Council strongly believe that the homestead should be saved in its entirety and restored to a safe standard in keeping with historical importance in our village and the main road scene. It's been indicated by the applicant that he would like to demolish the barns to give him the finance to restore the rest of the building. I will ask him to sort of guarantee that this went on that he would actually finish the, finish the existing property. The, the, the other way of overriding fact is the fact that we have lost that footpath on that side of the road now for many, many months is what is a very, very dangerous situation with pedestrians, with a lot of old people and children and parents going to school. And we feel this is very, very dangerous to be ongoing. Thank you. Thank you very much. Members, any questions for our speaker? Mm -hmm. Chris, thank you. Oh, sorry, can I the speaker? I'm oh. putting my hand up. Functionally well, too well. early. Thank you very much indeed, Mr. Thank you. And members, our second speaker, speaker is Mr. Ian Ritchie. Mr. Ritchie, can you take the turn? Welcome back to the Council House, Mr. Ritchie. Thank you, Chairman. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Ritchie, I'm sure you're familiar with the process now. Um, I'll tell you when the three minutes starts, and then when you have a minute remaining. Um, I don't know if the microphone has been left on, but the person should be able to. So it's it's green at the moment. Okay, that's fine. Okay, your time stops then. Thank you very much. Um, thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak. <clears throat> Firstly, I would like to uh, confirm our client's commitment to closing works <clears throat> on the listed farmhouse as soon as possible. Um, and uh, to put this uh, building back to its original form. As you know, it's already expended a substantial sum, uh, although uh, that does manifest itself in, uh, in a very pretty solution at the moment. Uh, up until the last part of the 20th century, the homestead was an attractive thatched roof, half timbered property with eyebrow dormers <coughs> and many original features. Sadly, both farmhouse and barn suffered extensive improvements which resulted in the demise of the thatch roofs and their raising and replacement with plain tiling to the farmhouse and sadly an asbestos roof to the barn. While some of the trusses were retained, a number were removed and the remaining timbers being modern and of minimal size, capable of supporting only the asbestos sheeting and some of the purlins consist of scaffold boards and elements of trees providing support. 
Fundamentally, there is no viable roof structure to the barn at present, thus the walls comprise a variety of brick types and sizes without any lateral ties or boarding or bonding. There is no longer any structural integrity in the external walls. The amount of the original heritage fabric is very small indeed <clears throat> and cannot be viably converted without rebuilding. I'm aware, Chairman, that yourself and Councillor Humphreys have visited the site and been inside the building. Apart from myself and the conservation officer, I'm not aware of anyone else who's actually inspected the site. The proposal for replacement of the barn is critical to the viability of the project and would result in a structure similar in massing appearance to the barn as it currently is. Uh, the remaining elements of the heritage fabric would be incorporated into the replacement and consist of some of the timber framing and the remaining addresses. We're aware of the comments made by the government, which we, of course, made that the benefit of the physical site visit. Uh, but we're surprised about some of the concerns because a measured building survey was undertaken at the outset of the project. Notwithstanding this, the applicants prepared to provide additional information and a method statement for dismantling the barn. The heritage consultant on this project throughout has been Dr. David Hickey, a former assistant director of English Heritage, who has maintained through all of his reports that the barn was of insufficient heritage significance to be worthy of retention. We're also aware of the concerns expressed by the county highways uh, and are not surprised by them. As the building was originally constructed a long time ago, built on the back of pavement on a bend, it inevitably fails to meet the visibility requirements of modern residential estate guidelines. The homestead originally comprised of three small cottages and the current proposal incorporates a number of improvements to the existing vehicular access, visibility and improvements to pedestrian safety. Some guidance from the members on the way distributed. Time has ended. Sorry? That's the end of your three minutes. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Ritchie. Member, do you have any questions for our speaker? Um, I, I got a couple of questions, Mr. Ritchie. Um, I, I hear what you say uh, that your, your client has a commitment to maintain and um, uh, bring the farmhouse itself back into viable use. We, we heard from uh, Mr. Treadwell earlier on that there is now very little protection from the elements uh, and that the tarpaulin roof has largely gone. Is that the case? Uh, I believe that is the case, yes. How does that sit with your client's commitment to protect the building? Well, I think the client was rather hoping that we would have uh, got to a point where a decision could be made about getting back on to doing the main roof of the farmhouse uh, some time ago. <coughs> Unfortunately, um, that hasn't uh, taken place I mean, we're in a situation where that is part of the current application. Um, the client is prepared to, to I mean, was, as I say, he was hoping that we'd have the roof back on by now, but that can't be done without actually uh, making a disconnection um, with the barn, the farmhouse. Um, uh, the applicant is prepared to uh, significantly look to protect the building, but, but the preference is really to get back on and get this job finished off. At the moment, it's partially done. Some of the main structural works have been done, um, but he needs to pursue that and as quickly as possible. Does replacement of the top order move require changing the connection to the bar? Uh, no. No. Thank you. Um, you also said your client was prepared to provide a method statement uh, as requested by a percentage. Is there a reason why that hasn't been done until yeah, then? It, it, it was because the author had uh, contracted COVID uh, and was unable to prepare that report ahead of um, where we are today. Thank you. Um, I'm sure you'll be aware that we have significant concerns as, as members regarding the condition of the list of building, and I absolutely understand. Um, the desire to generate additional financial viability uh, by doing works to the barn. Um, what can you say to give us confidence that the farmhouse won't fall down in the meantime because we've got no protection? Um, I think the, the, the farmhouse, uh, the stability and structural integrity of farmhouse has already been taken care of with some of the works that have been taking place at the moment. I think you need to be mindful of the fact that the timber frame, which the um, 
uh, historic England made reference to was not visible at the time that this uh, project started because the whole of the outside of this building was rendered in uh, in uh, sand cement render and internally it was plastered in conventional plaster which in turn caused the timber frame uh, to rot so the the structure integrity is actually being replaced by the replaced significant replacement of the oak members the uh, because the integrity of it was was questionable due to the rotting of the timber elements, the roof tiles were removed because their weight uh, was causing distress to the the, uh, the reduced timber frame. The work that had been done uh, to the base of the building the foundations and the and the, uh, the the timber frame uh, actually ensured that uh, the structural integrity is now intact. The tiles are palletized to the weight on site, ready to be uh, fixed as soon as possible. And the roof is not being done by having no timber provided. No, uh, well, no. I mean, the, the, the timbers are the timbers are obviously um, uh, 20, late twentieth century um, timbers that were that were uh, imported and put on the roof when the thatching was removed. The roof was raised by almost nine hundred millimeters, and they are twentieth century. Uh, elements they are not part of the of the heritage fabric um, they have protection but the whole of the roof needs to be uh, overhauled and reviewed uh, the the problem with this building is that in its uh, alterations uh, that occurred in the late 20th century there are lots of crimes that were committed against this building like cutting through parts of the uh, of the timber frame putting in openings in different places and uh, and, and other elements that had an impact on its uh, structural capabilities. Uh, and as a result of that, um, it needs the, the whole situation with regard to how that roof was done. We know what the original roof would have been like. What we don't know is, is the roof that was on the building uh, in the late 20th century, which was a modern roof with plain tiles on it. The, we can't fully uh, ascertain the state of that until we can get up there properly and uh, and get around the whole of the building and particularly the gable where it co-joins the barn. So just so I'm clear, Mr. Ritchie, your advice to the board is that there is no detriment to the building by not having a temporary roof or any other protection from the elements? No, I think that the think because time has marched on from where we thought we were going to be uh, some months ago. I think it's essential now that there are some works undertaken swiftly to protect the uh, the roof and the areas below the roof, and that that needs to be revisited. And I think the the uh, uh, applicant is aware of that, and I think uh, is committed to that. As I say originally, I think they hoped that we would be far further with this forward with this project than we currently are, and the critical point has been. Uh, where the two elements of the building are co-joined. Uh, and I understand the, the situation regarding the inconvenience of the footpath closure, but of course, we did have a structure engineer's report that said that, that, that expressed serious concerns about the stability uh, of the barn. Um, and obviously, uh, pedestrian safety has had to be considered. Um, but given the works that your client has done to stabilise the structure, is there an ongoing need for scaffolding? No, we're talking about the barn now, not the farmhouse. I mean, the, 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 the farmhouse has been stabilised. Fundamentally, the barn has no roof. Uh, I mean, it originally had a thatched roof with all of the uh, structural components uh, that, that formed that, uh, and that was taken away uh, and replaced by uh, an asbestos roof. And the timber members, I mean, you've been inside the building, you've seen those, uh, you've seen those elements. Uh, they would certainly be able to get uh, support the weight of, of, of any form of tiles. I mean, they're just about capable of uh, supporting uh, the asbestos sheets. And some of the purlins uh, are, in fact, scaffold boards, uh, etc. So entirely inappropriate. The roof has can't have any value at all. Uh, I mean, it's a, it was an asbestos roof. And even then, as an asbestos roof, the, the structure underneath it was, was um, insufficient for the job that it was doing. 
Thank you. Members, do you have any questions? Absolutely. I'm a little curious as to the reasons that we're being asked to demolish a listed building and replace it with something that is totally different. You know, there are many cases where buildings are demolished to enable work, but then are replaced the same. Um, it's, it, it's difficult to understand why this needs to be changed completely into two totally different buildings from the one that is there already. Well, I think that, um, firstly, I think it's important to understand just how much of the barn is actually original uh, heritage fabric. Uh, I mean, very clearly, the asbestos roof was not, and neither was the majority of the structure uh, that that was placed on top of. The external walls, as I've said, are actually, um, uh, they lack uh, natural stability. Uh, they comprise a mixture of, of uh, at least four different types of bricks, different bondings, uh, and they're not tied together in, in any way whatsoever. The actual element of, of the original heritage fabric in that part of the building is tiny. It has no roof. Uh, the walls have no uh, integrity. The, as far as the replacement is concerned, the proposal is to replace it with a building of a similar size, massing, and frontal appearance, and it also would be incorporating the inclusion of the existing timber framing on the front uh, and the uh, and the, the, the trusses that could be salvaged uh, out, of the, out of the residue of the roof. If there are no other questions, thank you. Thank you. Members, who would like to answer that? Yeah, I had a question actually for Mr. Brown. Um, I don't remember what it was you said now. Um, when you were talking about an urgent works notice, uh, did you say if the applicant doesn't do it, are we obliged, we as a council obliged to do it then? I think you said it's something that we could pay for, or is it something we must pay for? We have a choice, Mr. Chairman. We can choose whether to do it or not. Can we, sorry, can I follow this up? So we can't, um, the applicant's not obliged to do it either? No. Um, there, 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 there are clearly consequences if that happens, <laughs> and, 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 and we could serve this to building enforcement notice. Right. So there's, there, we, there, there are consequences for, for, for the applicant not complying. Uh, we can either serve an enforcement notice, um, on, or in fact, we could um, look at direct action. We have, there are choices available. Just, just to follow on from that, what I originally put the hand up was um, to, to ask if the uh, reason for delaying serving a notice like that of a month is to give the applicant time to get these further reports in. You know, we've been given an excuse that the uh, author of that report had COVID. Hopefully, that person is now fit and healthy again and able to complete the report. Um, you know, this has been going on for a while, and I, I find it difficult to believe that there is no detrimental to a building if you don't make it waterproof, which is the situation we're in at the moment. Um, and yeah, yeah, it's, it's Obviously, there are consequences for these actions. Um, but why aren't we considering an enforcement notice now, an urgent works notice rather? Now. Uh, yes, thank you, Chair. Uh, I, I'm concerned, I'm pretty concerned about this. I, I, uh, I was just thinking, that as we were reminiscing earlier, how long we've sat on this board and uh, how often. We've heard this story. How often poop someone's bought a, a listed building and uh, then said, "Well, we, we we need to do this and we need to do that and take taking the roof off and uh, and letting it uh, fall apart." I'm really concerned. I, I may be sort of getting cynical in my old age and, and the length of time I've served on this committee. Perhaps it's a uh, time we have retired. Um, 
but I, I'm really concerned about this, Chair. That uh, this, this, uh, you know, we 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 seem to we say we come across it such a lot, and I find it difficult to uh, accept. And I'm prepared to move the recommendation, Chair. Please don't retire, Councillor. <laughs> <laughs> it might retire me, Chair. Councillor <laughs> Pooh. Thank you, Chair. Um, I just read in this. It says it's been vacant for eight years. It also said the site once formed a site for wildlife in the centre, including bat roofs and nests. So we've already lost a protected species. Now we've lost the roof. And I've got to admit, nothing I've heard here tonight has convinced me that even if we let him take the barn down, that anything else is, is going to be done. But can I just go back on to what Councillor Bell said and ask the question to Mr Brown? Because uh, it reads here, the Planning Act Urgent Works Notice under Section 54 of the Planning Act. This will require scaffolding to be erected such as the building can be made watertight with a suitable cover. Members are advised that if such a notice is ultimately served and the applicant does not undertake necessary work to protect the building specified in it, the council may do so and recover the costs of doing from, from the applicant. Is that right? So, sorry, I'd like to propose that, Chair. Councillor Dunn. I think Councillor Coos has just done the. I was going to propose that we defer this application so an urgent worst notice can be developed and uh, we can move from there. Is that what you were saying? Yeah. In which case, I'll second you. <laughs> um, thank you. Uh, members, I, I share your concern, as you can probably imagine. Um, I, I am relatively relaxed, I have to say, with recommendation A, which I, I think just sets our position out. I, I am. Uh, I have to say, open-minded over the issue of demolition and the barn. Um, but for me, it's a question of where are we going? And we have a list of building. I mean, I think it would be almost unreasonable of us to require an urgent works notice to the barn, which I mean, we have an application for its demolition, which we have not yet determined. So I think we need to be clear that what we're primarily concerned about with the urgent works notice is, is the, the house itself. Um, but that shouldn't be taken as saying, well, actually, the barn isn't a list of building. It is. And the, the fact, I mean, I absolutely understand where which is coming from in terms of the, the lack of um, original historic features within it. But it is nevertheless a list of building and has the protection of the list of building legislation. I am concerned, members, that there is no roof on the barn, uh, on the house well. Um, I think, he, you know, I, I'm, I'm not um, qualified in this, so I can only express a lay person's concern, but I would have thought anything which has not got a roof on it in the winter will be being damaged. And I'm concerned about part B, um, that uh, it says we'll think about an urgent repairs notice on the 7th of February. I'd like us to consider that. And part of what I'm going to propose is very much aimed at Mr. Ritchie and his client to genuinely encourage them to do some work to protect this building. Um, so in the spirit of what I think Council Blues and Council Bell is saying, um, I'd like to... Um, propose an alternative element in respect of uh, section B, uh, which is that this board appoints a subcommittee consisting of five members of the uh, Planning and Development Board to consider whether to take action under section 54 of the Planning List of Buildings and Conservation Areas Act 1990 in relation to 82 Main Road, Wall Street. For the avoidance of any doubt, this will include the delegation of all powers in the 1990 Act, which may be required to undertake appropriate action. I'd like that um, subcommittee to, to meet swiftly. I think it's important that the subcommittee has a site visit to look at the site and for the applicant to have the opportunity of expressing their views to that subcommittee. But to continue to take no action in respect of a list of build, uh, sorry, an urgent works notice, I think is something I, I would be uncomfortable with. I absolutely understand the economic case that the applicant has and that they need to reasonably have a prospect of, of earning uh, a return. 
I equally absolutely understand the case of the residents of Wall Street who've had no footpath here for two years and see what was a beautiful list of building gradually deteriorate further and further. So, members, it's up to you how you vote, clearly. But I think recommendation A is reasonable as it stands. Recommendation B needs more urgent action. Councillor Mrs. Clinton. Chair, um, with that, I'm happy to withdraw my proposal. Thank you very much. Um, um, are there any other comments or questions? I, actually, I need a second of all my Councillor Berwick. Thank you. Are we all content with that? Can I see all those in favour? And those against? Thank you very much. That's enough. Members, we might now move to gender item. Yeah. Uh, sorry, I apologise. Uh, do you want to formally appoint those members of the committee now, so, committee now, so that uh, we can get on with any necessary arrangements for me? Um, I think if it is it's fine, technically it should be three from one group and two from the other. Um, yeah, Councillor Phillips, do you want to think about what your representation, representation will be, or are you happy to prompt somebody then? I'll oh, probably do. I mean, I've got nothing else that you want to. I'm happy to. Yeah. Maybe he's prodded. He's prodded, so yeah. And, and yourself? Yes, please. And from our side, I'd, I'd really like to be there. Um, Councillor Jarvis? Councillor Jarvis, I'm not sure if he'll be back in time. No. So I'll pod Councillor Lewis. <laughs> And I think we'll have courtesy invite the local members to attend if they are back to the UK. Sorry, but Councillor Rose is an independent. Should he yeah. be on this? Would you like to join us, Councillor Rose? Yeah, I'll, I'll join. Yeah, yeah my Councillor Rose as well. So we, we can have so six members that we will actually have them chair, which is if you're if you're happy to do that. I know you said you proposed with five, but I, I don't think in the scheme of things, amending to six is going to be an issue. You've got to draw power under oh. under standing order 23 and to six. So if that is six, six six members, if you're happy to do so. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm happy to be six. I, I, I don't think this is a, so a critical political issue. It's rather more, yeah. let's get the right thing done. Which is it shouldn't be. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so just, just make sure I've got the right suit. Councillor Dillon, Councillor Phillips, you're yeah. starting chair. Yeah. Councillor yeah. Cruz, and I missed the other. Um, did you speak to Councillor Jarvis? It is Chancellor Jarvis, yes. And Councillor Lowe. Thank you, Councillor Jarvis. Thank you. Are we all happy with that? Absolutely. Thank you very much. Um, I, I, but we need to meet as soon as possible on that one. Yes. Yeah. 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 Check yeah. with you tomorrow um, and check dates for all those members and, and get the meeting as soon as possible. Absolutely. I, I think in reality, you probably need to. We could also, or maybe 10 days or so, to give the applicant time to react um, rather than meeting. And, and, and I'd like to give them some time to consider what they're going to Perhaps we'll have a plan by then. <laughs> that would be nice, wouldn't it? Um, so, members, we now move on to um, application number 653 for 17 Norton Road, Council. Uh, we have our speaker, Ms. Um, Ms. Corinna Hill. Um, Ms. Schultz, if you could stand by. I apologise, you've been standing by for an awful long time already, uh, but Mr. Brown will now introduce the report. Mr. Brown. All right, thank you, Mr. Chairman. You just run through the broken slides, which are repeated from the, the paper copy you have in front of you. Lawton Road, um, a range of houses, as you can see here. The application site is the one here with the rear extension, and you, and you can see the houses on either side. Um, this is the existing um, ground floor with the extension and um, kitchen extension, which I just referred to, um, and the uh, neighbouring houses next door. Um, the existing elevation, um, this is the kitchen extension at the rear, patio doors in the main building. So the side elevation um, is this one, which is the kitchen extension, and the patio doors here are in fact in that elevation here. Um, and that is the elevation, side elevation on the other side. This is the, the one on number 15. Proposal is to demolish that extension, um, existing kitchen extension, and put this um, single storey extension across the whole of the rear, as you can see, coming out 4.15 metres. And in terms of the actual um, elevations, the rear elevation is that, you saw the opening doors on the other plan, um, and the, side the equivalent side elevations are this one, 
And that one, this is one is the one where, in fact, the, the, the on the side of the objectors house, and you can see the difference in levels, um, which in fact um, is referred to in, in the report. Um, there's a fence here added um, to, to, to alleviate some of the some of the issues involved. As you can see, Mr. Chairman, um, this, this, this has become quite involved um, in the sense that um, a planning commission was granted for a, a similar extension not a long while ago. Work started. Um, it was clear that um, that work was unauthorised. It didn't follow the approved plans. Um, so therefore, the applicant has selected to submit an amended plan, which is one you have in front of you. Um, uh, there's also the issue of the fallback position. In other words, what could the applicant do under permitted development um, in any event? Um, and this is slightly bigger than that could be done in permitted develop under permitted development. And there's also the question of the levels, which are referred to in the report, because the initial plans did not accurately show uh, the drop in levels um, that you can see on here, um, on, on the rear elevation that you can see here now, um, as, as, as also on the side elevation here. Um, the amended plan has gone out to, to consultation. Um, we have received an objection from the next door neighbour. Um, that was circulated to you some time ago, and I've copied it again from members on, the, on their desks this evening. It's quite a lengthy objection, uh, but all, it does contain pertinent, pertinent points. Um, the recommendations in front of you, Mr Chairman, is very much one of balance. Uh, because of the issues involved, particularly the past planning commission, permitted development rights, um, and it reflects the change in levels. Um, so therefore, it's very much a balanced recommendation that you have in front of you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Carl. Um, Mr. Chairman, welcome at the moment after the meeting. Um, Mr. President. Yeah. Yeah. I'll probably start in occupations in some three minutes in which to address the board. So I'll, I'll let you know when that starts. Yeah, we see have one minute remaining, and then yeah. Could we put the speaker onto the screen? Just bear with us for a moment. Make sure we're not starting. It should catch her when she starts talking. Yeah, yeah. thanks very much. Mr. Chairman, that's how he starts now. Yeah. So, Good evening, everyone. Can you hear me okay? We can, thank you. Yes. Yeah. Brilliant. Thank you for the opportunity to speak this evening. Um, we acknowledge a measurement was mistakenly miscalculated in relation to the ground level of next door. Um, the surveyor couldn't get access to the garden on the day um, when they came to me, but thought a correct measurement would be achieved from my side. This was not done to deceive the council. It was an honest error out of hundreds of measurements that were taken on that day of the survey. We were only made aware of this large disparity once the extension was almost completed and the council had then become involved where we stopped works immediately. The builder had not followed the approved design in any way whatsoever with the wrong type of flat roof built, including a parapet wall that had made the extension appear a lot higher than the way it had been designed. The main roof was also built higher and the other more minor errors were like the roof lantern and the doors being installed the wrong way. We therefore strongly feel the builder has made up his own design and not followed the approved drawings that we submitted. However, we feel for the neighbour next door and want this issue resolve, resolved ASAP. Once made aware of the problem, I immediately contacted the company who did the approved drawings and came to site, stopped all works, and we created new drawings that the council are happy to recommend to you for approval to, and to the board, as I understand. In my view, the height from the ground level is well below the three metre eaves height allowed under PD rights. So we hope this extra reduction in the height and going as far as lowering the internal ceiling as much as possible will make this extension acceptable to the neighbour and to yourselves as the board. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much indeed. Members, do you have any questions for our speaker? No? In which case, thank you. Um, members, any comments, questions, proposals? Your recommendations been proposed, but I'm permitted granted. Do I have a second after that? Thank you very much, Councillor Hancock. So, proposed and second as a permission is granted. Can I see those in favour? Any against? 
apologies again for the wait, but you got consent in the end. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye. Goodbye. Um, members, we move on to our next item, which is 451 uh, for Blackberry Farm, Blackberry Lane, near Marston. Um, Mr. Guy Breeden is our speaker and will be joining us by uh, by teams. And um, again, Mr. Breeden, apologies for the length of time you've been waiting. Um, could you stand by a little longer while Mr. Brown introduces the report? No, Mr. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. All I'm going to do is refer you to, to the report. Um, um, members, uh, the plans are attached um, at the, the back of the report, but for some reason that they're not attached um, on the screen. Um, however, they if members refer to page 67 of um, 87 on the paper copies 5k353 um, members can see the existing location plan top right um, there um, and the site survey um, on the on the left hand side on the right hand side of the garden um, with the um, proposed plans um, on the plan below um, and you can see the difference between the two plans um, the top right shows the existing clubhouse by the lake um, and then the, um, the, the proposed clubhouse, you can see there, uh, it might be considerably larger. Um, and in fact, over the page, um, you'll see the elevations of the new clubhouse. Um, members have visited the site on a couple of occasions, um, and the overriding issue is the adverse impact on the green belt. Um, there was clearly a previous appeal decision here, um, and that's copied for members um, as an appendix to the report. Um, and that appeal was in fact dismissed. Um, this particular proposal is a far larger scheme than that which was dismissed at appeal. And therefore the key issue is whether or not um, there is further justification for a larger building. Um, officers certainly um, accept that the replacement could just be well be justified here on safety, security, for safety and security reasons and to accommodate a wide range, wider range of users, particularly for disabled facilities and matters like that. Um, uh, but whether or not that there's a substantially greater one, um, that's a matter of which I think we yet have to be convinced. Um, there is some concern expressed locally that a larger building will um, increase the potential for use and thus noise. Um, however, the report makes it absolutely clear that noise issues are presently dealt with by uh, um, other legislation um, and that section of the report sets that noise and hours conditions on the shooting are not appropriate here. Um, the report does indicate that there have been some discussions about taking a more comprehensive look at the site um, um, and references perhaps to some new funding on the site. Um, and that's the way I think that this, this particular case should be going, <coughs> rather than just looking at item by item. It needs a comprehensive look. Um, uh, the applicant will speak to you later on, Mr. Chairman, um, and I, it may well be that he um, requests a deferral. Um, members have been to the site visits, sorry, members have been to the site now on two occasions, and therefore clearly a, a further site visit is, is, is not to be supported. However, um, the applicant is suggesting that his own case is not fully represented in the report um, and that he wishes to have the opportunity um, in a further report, a supplementary report, um, to put his case properly, in his view, properly to the board. Um, this question really met Mr Chairman member whether members are prepared to accept the recommendation as it is, or whether they feel that they need a fuller report so that they can properly um, understand um, where the applicant is coming from. And I'm sure the um, speaker, Mr Chairman, will explain that in more detail. Thank you, Mr Brown. Um, Mr Green, welcome to the meeting. Mr Chairman. Thank you. In Mr. Brewer, you may have seen the previous applications that you'll be allowed three minutes to address the board. And I'll tell you when your time starts. When you have one minute remaining, I think you need time to go. Thank you. Okay, thanks for giving me the opportunity to speak to you. Um, I asked the committee to defer the decision uh, this evening for the following reasons. We've had several meetings and discussions with committee members and officers regarding the application since registration. But further to our meeting on the 5th of November 2021 in particular, we have chased a response from the committee and officers throughout December with regard to proposed noise attenuation measures and any feedback from the council environmental health officers. We received the officers report on the 23rd of December 
immediately before the Christmas holidays. It was too late for us to address matters as the application was to be presented tonight, 10th of January. The case officer was unavailable until the 4th of January to discuss his report. Our planning consultant was also out of the country until today. Part of the reason for the refusal of the application relates to highways. Our highways expert has come back to a has come to a totally different opinion to the council's highway officer, but this has not been considered in the report. The opposing view is not our personal view, but that of our highways consultant. We feel that members should be provided with both sides of the argument, which is not the case within the officer's report. Since the 4th of January, we've been in discussion with uh, Andrew Collinson, the case officer, proposing ways to amend the scheme Uh, from which the feedback has been very positive. As the application has been under consideration for so long, it would seem unsensible to refuse the application when a solution may well have been found. We're really keen to work with the members and officers to this end, as we have done throughout the process. I therefore respectfully ask the committee to defer their decision until pending matters have been explored fully. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Green. Members, do you have any questions for our speaker? Uh, uh, Councillor Parton. Thank you, um, I'm just wondering, Mr. Green, do you have any any um, idea of when these discussions are likely to be concluded? I mean, it seems you're making some progress. Um, have, can you give us an indication about when you think you might actually be ready to, to uh, proceed using it? Okay, we're looking uh, for a a Teams meeting uh, with Andrew and Jeff, hopefully, uh, to discuss alternatives for the uh, proposed application um, as soon as we can get that meeting. So I'd hope within four to six weeks we are in a position to to, uh, instruct new drawings or whatever we decide is the the correct way forwards uh, to get support from the local authority. Thank you. That's uh, Have we seen the paperwork from the different highway agency that you spoke about? Um, yes, it has been submitted, but it wasn't in, included in the officer's report. Thank you. And uh, from me, Mr. Green, please accept my apology for the um, issues you've experienced over the, the, the most recent period in terms of having a response from us. I am sorry that we didn't get back to you sooner, uh, and I do apologise. That's accepted, no problem. <laughs> um, as there's no other um, questions, thank you very much, Mr. Green. Thank you. Um, members, this application has been with us since 2019. I, I don't think you're know, going to suffer by agreeing to Mr. Green's request for a deferment. You know, he's made the point that there are issues in here which he feels is not fairly represented in his case. Um, so I, I would propose deferment. That's second to my counsel. I propose deferment, so I'll thank you. Thank you much. Councilor. I'd just like to make a comment on that. I think I've been there three or four. At least three times now, and every time yeah. it's been different. Mm. So it's it, it's not totally accurate to say that it's been with us since 2019. I think we're talking about something that is entirely different. Last November, from what we were looking at last August, was it? Or, I, mean, I, I, I accept your point. Yeah. Um, what I was meaning was the application was submitted in 2019, and we, we, one way or other, I think we should have made a decision. But we are where we are. Um, Oh, so it's been proposed and for deferment. Can I see those in favour? And any against? That's unanimous. So apologies if we kept you waiting so long, Mr. Beaton, but we, we are happy to defer. That's fine. Business must be done. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Anna. Um, members, that's the end of the planning applications we have to determine. Uh, the, the next item is an appeal update. Mr. Brown. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. There's two, two appeals which are reported there, um, both Gypsy and Traveller ones. Um, 
31 refused um, and one approved. Um, I just want to mention the one that was refused, Cliff. Um, the, the report refers to the fact that it's decided subject to a court order um, and a further report will be prepared in due course. That will clearly come to you, but I can outline to you what, what will be in that report or the substance of that report. It's the court order, um, basically an injunction, um, asking, um, requesting um, that, that Mr Doherty actually leaves the site and takes his caravans and, uh, with him um, and restores the site. Um, the court basically said that if, an, that if an appeal was lodged against the current application and that was dismissed, or if the plan position had been refused, um, then he should um, vacate the site within eight weeks of that decision. So um, the decision here um, on the cliff site, um, just looking through the appeal paper myself, is 13th of December. So he has eight weeks from the 13th of December to move and restore the site, um, which is, I think, the first week in February. Um, if not, um, then clearly um, we will be back in court, I'm assuming if board gives us authorization to do so, uh, for contempt proceedings. Um, clearly, um, we have been in touch with Mr Doherty, and he has been in touch with us. Um, he, he's aware of the situation, um, and he is making efforts to move. Uh, but clearly there will be have to be some, a couple of drive-bys and a couple of site visits, um, clearly at the beginning in February, to see what actually has been happened on site. Um, you know, he's aware of court order, he's aware of its content, and so are we. Um, so, <coughs> Mr Chairman, that further report um, would depend on what happens on site in the next three or four weeks, basically. Thank you, Mr. Brown. Uh, members, there are an issue that I think we should um, discuss on enforcement here, but I'm wary of doing that in public session. Um, so I'd like to move under whatever section of the Local Government Act 1974 we can now move into that section. All those in favour? Thank you very much. That's unanimous. Um, if you 